Welcome to Detroit History Heroes, the show where we talk about some fantastic Detroiters. My name is Kayla, and I work for the Detroit Historical Society. My name is Dean, and I also work at the Detroit Historical Society. You know, Kayla and I have just been so excited about the return of Detroit History Heroes. We loved making last season, and we're so excited to bring you this next season with a ton of special guests, so happy to be back. 2020 has been a tumultuous and challenging year for many of us, as we've experienced a historic whirlwind. In many aspects, our entire lives have changed. And so for our first episode this season, we wanted to highlight someone whose life was punctuated by changes in Detroit, the United States, and the world. Today we're talking about Grace Lee Boggs, the activist and leader who worked tirelessly for almost 80 years to change the world. Grace Lee Boggs was born in Rhode Island in 1915, the daughter of two Chinese immigrants. Grace often noted that her parents' tenacity and resolve had a major impact in her life, particularly her mother's. Her family ran an extremely successful restaurant in New York City, where they moved to when Grace was young. Now, this was a time in American history where people of Asian descent, particularly those from China, were treated especially harshly by the American government with laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act and were often the target of hate crimes. Despite this, Grace was afforded many opportunities in her education. She went to Barnard College where she studied philosophy. She then went to Bryn Mawr to get her PhD. There she discovered the work of Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, a 19th century philosopher. For the rest of her life, Grace Lee Boggs was influenced by the idea of Hegelian dialectics. Dialectics is a concept that explores why certain ideas are true by talking about them from multiple viewpoints. Hegelian dialectics work like this. You have a concept or a thesis, a statement that could be true. For example, Star Trek is better than Star Wars because it uses space exploration to explore the future of our world. Then you have a reaction or a counter argument. For example, no, Star Wars is better than Star Trek because it uses myth like Arthurian legend to tell a compelling story of fantasy set in a galaxy far, far away, Dean. But somewhere in the middle is the truth. And that's the most important part to Hegelian dialectics. It's about finding the balance between two opposing arguments. Star Trek and Star Wars are two completely different stories, down from the genre to the medium, and comparing them would be like comparing apples and pears. They have a lot of similarities, but they're not the same thing. Grace took this concept as she moved forward into activism, but life after graduate school was not easy, especially because she was an Asian American woman. Even department stores wouldn't hire her because of her ethnicity. She did end up finding a philosophy librarian job in a metropolitan, populous Midwest city on the Great Lakes. I'm talking, of course, about Chicago. You thought I was going to say Detroit, didn't you? Don't worry, we'll get there. I promise. Grace's home in Chicago was in a poor, mostly African-American neighborhood where rats infested her basement. It was the only place she could afford on her meager salary, and it was one of the few places that would rent to an Asian woman. One day, while taking a stroll through her neighborhood, Grace saw her neighbors protesting the poor housing conditions they lived in. She joined in immediately. The year was 1941, and although for many in the country the Great Depression was ending due to works programs, many African Americans still were suffering from the effects of the Great Depression, and it changed how Grace viewed issues of justice for the rest of her life. Grace later said, I was aware people were struggling, but it was more of a statistical thing. Here in Chicago, I was coming in contact with it as a human thing. Grace began getting involved with issues of equality for the African American community. She joined up with the March on Washington movement, or M-O-W-M, MAOM. -M. Now, I should clarify, this isn't the same March on Washington movement that was led by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1963. We'll get to that one in a little bit. This March on Washington movement began in 1941, right around the time the U.S. started making munitions to send over to our allies in World War II. For more information on that part of American history, you can check out our Rosie the Riveter episode. We'll link it down below. While these factories were willing to hire African Americans, they were given lower paid menial labor jobs such as janitorial staff. So the leaders of the movement decided to plan a march onto Washington, D.C. Over 100,000 people were ready to participate, including Grace. Just the idea that all of these people were ready to mobilize caused the U.S. government to act. 
Mere weeks before the event was supposed to take place, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the New Deal one, not the teddy bear one, decided to sign an executive order to create the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which created more equitable hiring and jobs in factories. Although the march didn't happen, its lessons of collective action leading to great change became the blueprint of the civil rights movement that would happen just a couple years down the line, and it was still an incredible source of inspiration for Grace. Another one of her inspirations was C.L.R. James, a theorist who sought to use dialectics to create change in society. C.L.R. James, Grace, and others created the Johnson Forest Tendencies and spent the 1940s writing. However, they had to use pen names because their ideas were considered radical and dangerous. So dangerous that C.L.R. James, a native of Trinidad, was later kicked out of the United States. Now, you may be asking, Dean, why would anyone consider an idea dangerous? What a great question! Let's talk about a familiar idea that had people shook back in the day. Hey Kayla, I think it's time for some flash footnotes. In the 19th century, a new technology was all the rage as a fun new way to travel. It was fast, efficient, and popular amongst middle class men. But with that popularity came controversy. What you are about to hear today may shock you. We are speaking today about a most violent contraption, an unspeakable scourge, the real public enemy number one. An enemy that goes by many names and is taking over our cities, creating a public health crisis like we've never seen before. I am speaking, of course, of the Velocipede, the Hobby Horse, the Bicycle. I mean, to be fair, there were legitimate concerns about early bicycles. Notice this penny farthing. Its big wheel up front compared to its tiny wheel in the back made it very difficult to balance, and accidents were frequent. And this was an improvement on the first bicycles. This changed with the invention of the safety bicycle in 1885 in England. Bicycles were easier to handle and sold like crazy in stores like Huber and Metzger's in downtown Detroit, which served a sizable female clientele. Huber and Metzger's was also one of the largest bike sellers in the country. Bikes for women meant more independence because they were an easier and safer mode of transportation than horse-drawn carriages and streetcars. Susan B. Anthony said, I think it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. It inspired women's fashion to change from floor-length dresses with bustles to ankle-length skirts, which had a much more practical cut. Some women began wearing pants during this era. There was a name for this bicycle-racing, college-educated, independent, ankle-showing woman. The New Woman. Yes, this new woman! Wearing pants, showing her ankles! Women are getting too sporty these days, if you ask me. I mean, surely we're all aware that bicycles are simply too much for a woman to handle. All that exercise will ruin her delicate humanity. I mean, even Dr. A. Shadwell says that if women ride bicycles, they'll come down with all sorts of ailments, like, just, just like, um, like depression, uh, insomnia, exhaustion, heart palpitations, that sounds serious, um, migraines, um, uh, pale skin, uh, facial, facial twitching, and, um, what's the, uh, oh, uh, dysentery, um, this seems a little excessive. Did people really believe this? Yes, they did. Women bikers were apparently susceptible to a number of diseases, from goiters to appendicitis, but the worst of these was the dreaded bicycle face. Ah, yes, bicycle face. That horrid disease that causes a permanent expression of anger. You bare your teeth and grow dark circles under your eyes. Your whole face turns beet red. As Dr. Shadwell says, has anybody ever seen persons on bicycles talking and laughing and acting jolly? Never. The concern spread like wildfire, but it was really unfounded. In fact, within two years of Dr. Shadwell's article, the myth of bicycle face was debunked. The real societal concern was that women were breaking out from the norm and doing new things, like traveling, going to college, getting jobs, and wanting to vote. 
One journalist kept seeing women biking around San Francisco and said, what the interested public wishes to know is where all the women on wheels are going. He seemed genuinely confused that these women would want to have a life outside of their homes. And they did. The bicycle provided freedom for many women and helped them carve a new place in society. The bicycle helped pave the way for the right to vote. It's funny today to think about how people responded to something as everyday as the bicycle, but it serves as a good reminder. New ideas can seem strange and even scary, but through understanding those ideas, we have the chance to create positive change for our society. Grace Lee Boggs believed that was the best way to affect social change. Let's pick up with her story in Detroit after World War II. Grace moved to another populous, metropolitan Midwest city on the Great Lakes. Can you guess which one it is? Detroit! I told you we'd talk about it! Grace started working for a leftist newsletter called The Correspondence, and there she met James Boggs, who was known as Jimmy. Jimmy, like many African Americans, moved to Detroit from the South. His day job was working on the line for Chrysler, but he spent much of his free time writing about social class, race, and politics. It was during the 1950s and 60s, in the midst of the civil rights movement, that Grace began speaking openly and publicly on issues of race. She became a public figure in the fight for equality, not only for African Americans and Asian Americans, but all marginalized groups that did not have societal power. She wasn't only known in the city of Detroit, but across the nation as well. She was one of the organizers of the Detroit Walk to Freedom in the summer of 1963. 125,000 people marched on Woodward Avenue, led by Mayor of Detroit at the time, Jerome Cavanaugh, Walter Ruther, the labor organizer, Reverend Albert Klieg, Reverend C. L. Franklin, the father of singer Aretha Franklin, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., of course. After that in Cobo Hall, Dr. King gave his first version of the I Have a Dream speech. That's right, that speech took place in Detroit. Grace was also at the March on Washington in August. She helped found a brand new political party called the Freedom Now Party. She was also a friend of Malcolm X's, inviting him to speak in Detroit in November. And all of that happened in just one year. Between 1963 and 1967, the civil rights movement shifted its focus. The early days of the movement were focused on bringing the issue of racial inequity to an international audience, how African Americans, especially in the South, were being treated as second-class citizens and wanted to be treated fairly. But it became clear that these activists working towards civil rights, such as school integration and voting rights, were being met with resistance, sometimes violently. So the movement began to change as well. Another manifestation of this change was an era of uprisings. One of those uprisings happened right here in the city of Detroit in 1967. Grace and Jimmy Boggs' work was even cited as one of the influences on that event, even though they weren't in the city at the time. Now, we could make an entire video series just about those seven days in Detroit's history, the causes and impacts thereof. But rather than hear from us, we encourage you guys to explore the Detroit 1967 project at Detroit1967.org and hear from those who experienced the events firsthand. Following the events of 1967, Grace and Jimmy began taking stock of what was happening in the country. They used this opportunity to write about revolutions that have happened in other countries and think about how people in the U.S. could work together to form a better society for everybody. The resulting book was called Revolution and Evolution in the 20th Century, their most famous work. The book hinges on the idea that big societal changes always start with small, grassroots movements. Or to quote Grace herself, we are the leaders we've been looking for. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, Grace worked tirelessly along with her husband to continue the work that they had started in the prior decades. Grace founded the Asian American Political Alliance and the National Organization for an American Revolution, which pushed for more action as opposed to conversation and theory. In 1992, she and Jimmy started the Detroit Summer Project. Now, the initial goal was to get young people involved in their communities by having them work on revitalization projects in Detroit's vacant lots. That work continues even today with teens and volunteers working on community-based projects. The program was designed so that young people could see that making a difference makes you different and that long-term sustainable change starts in small but meaningful ways. 
Unfortunately, Jimmy died in 1993 at the age of 74. This was a significant loss for Grace, of course, but she continued to forge the path forward, honoring his legacy and continuing to cement her own. In 1995, the Bog Center was open in honor of Grace and Jimmy's work and their contributions to the community in the city of Detroit. The organization helps develop grassroots, people-led movements and makes them more strategic as they move to achieve their goals. Grace, of course, continued to write throughout the remainder of her life. She wrote her autobiography in 1998 called Living for Change. She continued to publish columns in various newspapers, newsletters, and websites regularly until 2011. Grace Lee Boggs celebrated her 100th birthday in June of 2015 and passed away on October 5th of that same year. The life and legacy of Grace Lee Boggs can't really be boiled down into a few words or even a video as long as this one. Her life gives us so many lessons to take away about changing the injustices we see in the world. Every revolution, every change we think needs to be made, it starts with us. Whether it's riding a bicycle that leads to the right to vote. Or protesting rat-infested apartments leading to a lifetime of activism. Each one of us is capable of making change. To quote Grace Lee Boggs, you don't get to choose what time you live in, but you do get to choose who you want to be, and how you want to think. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe to the Detroit Historical Society channel. And let us know in the comments which Detroit history hero you want to hear about next. If you want to learn more about Grace Lee Boggs and the civil rights movement in Detroit, you can visit our website at DetroitHistorical.org. Hang out with us on Facebook at Detroit Historical Society, and you can follow us on Twitter at DHS Detroit and on Instagram at Detroit Historical. My name is Dean. My name is Kayla, and this has been Detroit History Heroes. We're back 2021. Let's go!